Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Evo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and I'll actually be here this whole week, thank mm-hmm. God. And then I will be off again the following week for two, uh, Monday and Wednesday. So sorry about that. I know it's not consistent, and so we're not getting consistent views either, but that's my fault. So appreciate those that do watch this and share this Devo with anybody else. So if you are in the neighborhood, like to join us when I'm here, you're more than welcome to at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Oh. Today we'll, we'll continue to be in 2 Timothy, and we're actually going to look at chapter 3, which is a great chapter uh, dealing with, uh, with our culture today. I love how relevant the Word of God is. It's like taking history, pulling it out from a you know hard copy of a, a film, and then placing it today, and it just fits so perfectly. So let's pray. Father God, we we come before you, Lord, and we know, Father, that I cannot convince anyone of the truth, Lord. That has to be your Holy Spirit as you draw them to yourself. And it is the Holy Spirit who illuminates that truth to us, Father. So I pray for those that understand, Lord God, that they would also have uh, the power to be obedient to your word also, Lord. And those that do not understand, I pray for one thing, and the only thing I can pray for, Father, is for their salvation. And pray that the Holy Spirit would open their eyes and understanding, Lord, to your truth. Father, may you just encourage us today, Lord, as we look at chapter 3 of uh, 2 Timothy, and we see so many similarities of the time of Paul to today's time and what's going on in the world. But I really believe, Lord, that we are living in the last days, and, and I'm not talking about the days of where a man stands on a corner with a billboard on both sides of him saying, repent for the end is near. I, I just believe that all the signs are there all at once, not a few here and there. But Lord, we just see so many of the signs that Paul talked about, that Jesus talked about, that Peter talked about, Lord. All the apostles talked about what happened in the last days. And so I think we're really so much closer to the end than what we think. And I just pray, Lord, that your people, who are called by your name, who are born again, would wake up, Lord. Yes, Lord. And I truly wake up, Lord, and see what is happening. And I do pray for revival to come to our land and to the world, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning, Moses, all the way from India. Hyderabad. Wow. I'm gonna, I hope to visit real soon after my trip to, uh, to my short missions trip coming up in October. I can't say a whole lot. So, all right, let's open up our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, chapter 3 has 20 signs of the last day. That, that is a lot of signs yeah. to talk about, just in one chapter, and actually in a few verses, less than, than 10 verses. <clears throat> so he gives us very clearly some of the signs that we will see in the last days that will be happening to the church <coughs> and in the world as Christ is, ret- is preparing to return to rapture the church out and then usher in the tribulation period And then his second coming will take place at the end of the tribulation period. So I believe, and I'm not the only one that believes this, there are other uh, good Christian men that are not necessarily apologetists, but pastors who just study the scriptures and they've seen the signs that are going on in our world today, really do believe that we're living in the last days, that God's soon return is coming. And he will come for those Christians who are born again that love Jesus Christ with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength and love their neighbors themselves and are um, hungering for the truth that the Bible speaks about. So let's go ahead and look at verse 1 of chapter 3. Paul is speaking to young Timothy, who's a pastor of a church, and Timothy's having a lot of issues within that church that he has to deal with. And one of the issues that he's dealing with is there are people within the church saying that Jesus is not coming back that um, 
he never will come back. And so Paul is dealing with that and saying, these are the signs of his return. And when we see these signs, as Jesus said, they're birth pangs to when he will come back. And he likens it to a pregnancy. You know, you get pregnant and a month later, you're one month pregnant, two months, three months. And as you get closer to pregnancy, it's obvious that you're pregnant and it's obvious that you're ready uh, to uh, have your child because of the size of the woman's belly. And I think that we can kind of take that picture that Jesus gave us and apply it to the world today, that we see the size of what's going on in the world today. So Paul says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, Paul says that in the last days before the second coming of Christ, there will be perilous times, times of great stress. Now, I don't have the time to get into all of that. <laughs> So I think that just as you are informed about what's going on in the world today, whether it's political, social, or personal in your own life, but as you view all these things, we are living in stressful times. Amen. Pastors, and, and just because this is a, a, a touchy subject, uh, the last few weeks are committing suicide, dealing with stress, uh, which is nothing different, by the way. They dealt with stress during Paul's time. During the 1800s, uh, I just posted something with Spurgeon. And Spurgeon talks about how he dealt with stress. And that the only thing that, that got him through the stress and anxieties was Jesus Christ and focusing and praying and seeking him and his word and trusting in him completely. And he also mentioned that, uh, that, that these are mental illnesses and not necessarily um, something spiritual in the sense that you can remove it because you're a spiritual man. But he said, no, I, I seek the Lord and this is something that I deal with daily. Even Spurgeon himself, uh, stressful times, <coughs> pastors committing suicide. I think that's a sign of the end times. Yeah. That even God's children, his elect, those that he has chosen to represent him are under great stress that they are taking their own lives. Uh, this last week, a pastor took his life I believe last year, another pastor took his life in Chino, Ontario area. A friend of mine who was heavily involved with ministry took his life, and I'm sure that there are many more. Uh, you look at the world today, the stress in the political arena with Trump, uh, the uh, conservatives and the liberals, the Republicans and the Democrats, the libertarians, and all of them, there's just a lot of stress, a lot of opinions, a lot of uh, thoughts there and, and just that world. You go to India where I've been, there's persecution of the Christian church there. They're now talking about removing all Christians from India. You go to South Sudan, there's stress there um, uh, against the Muslims who are trying to take over the liberties of the South Sudanese. Uh, you go anywhere and there's stress. You go to China and right now China has over 160 million cameras in their country watching everybody watching everything you do, facial recognition, and they're reading people's uh, uh, habits and characteristics. And if you misbehave according to China standards, then they will arrest you and put you into school and teach you how you ought to behave in the China culture. So there's a lot of stress everywhere. Uh, stress of the world itself. How many earthquakes have we been seeing lately? We just had one last week in Marietta, four point something. Uh, several in other places. If you get a earthquake app, you'll see that there's 4.6.0s in Indonesia, right off the coast there in the ocean, happening all the time. Uh, these are things of stress that Paul talks about. Now he gets into the details of this. Now he says, for men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of themselves. So one of the signs of the end is that men will love themselves rather than love others. Uh, they'll be more concerned for themselves than others. Uh, you see that. I shared a story with our church uh, recently where I was at Costco and two elderly people, and we get it. When you get to a certain age, you have this honorary uh, personality about you, you know, get out of my way because I've lived life and I have rights and, you know, and I don't care anymore, you know. And these couples, this couple were two in two of these vehicles right in the middle of the aisle just talking. And people were trying to go around them and there was, you know, congestion there and people getting in and out. And finally I was able to squeeze through and then she started her little, her little uh, cart there and it hit me. And she just, you know, startled 
and I got startled and she just reversed and backed up without saying sorry, excuse me, nothing. And I'm just like, wow, just totally into self. You watch drivers, totally into self. You watch people, it's all about them, them, them. Uh, when the Bible teaches the opposite, Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself already. The issues today in our society are not about loving ourselves. The issue is that we need to learn to love others more than ourselves. But we love ourselves. That's one of the signs. Lovers of money. Again, lovers of money. In the political arena, you have Trump who's a billionaire. You have politicians who are about money, trying to make money. I have a friend, and I'll, I'll just share this with you. I'm not going to tell you who he is. He's in the political uh, <clears throat> arena. He was running for a certain office that handled the treasury uh, monies. And he was sharing with me what these guys do with that money. And that's why he wanted to... Uh, get this one person out of office because he was giving that money to people that would give him favors. And so the, the way you get this kind of money is you send in applications and then if you get approved, they give you grants. And so what he was doing was telling his friends and people to s send in these letters and then he would give them the grants. And of course, then they would give him kickbacks on that. This is what's happening because of the love of money. The love of money within the church. And I'm just going to say this, just within the church itself, people are not giving to church anymore because they love their money. How do I know they love their money? Because they're keeping it and they're not giving it away to the Lord. Oh, but they got bills. They got, oh, I get that. But 10% of it belongs to the Lord. And, and Malachi says that you're robbing God if you don't give your 10%. So that's a love of money. Uh, lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boast, they boast. They boast in their power, they boast in their knowledge, they boast in who they are, they boast in their pride, they boast, boast, boast. You know, if we're going to boast, let's boast in Jesus Christ. Uh, they're proud. And I'm just going to read some of these blasphemers. They blaspheme God. They use His name in vain constantly. They take God's name and they bring it to their level and they turn it into a curse word and they spew it out of their mouth. They're blasphemers against God. They are slanderers against God's people. Even God's people are slanderers against God's people. <laughs> this is the day and age that we're living in. Uh, they're disobedient to parents. Boy, that's, that's crazy how these kids are. I just heard, I just heard uh, someone this, this week said that they didn't want to go with their family to the fair, so they called in a bomb threat. Oh, and so they shut down the whole fair until they uh, you know, checked it all out and cleared it that it was no bombs. And then they find out that this little kid called it in because he didn't want to go to the fair with his parents. I and mean, this is a lack of uh, respect for their parents and honor. Um, calling your parents liars, cheaters, mm. you know, saying they don't know anything. These, these are things that are just examples of what's going on in the world today with their parents. You go back to the time of Germany and, and, and you see that Hitler was able to get the children to turn in their parents if they were not following the laws. Mm. And so they respected more the government than they respected their own parents. Now, by the way, this is happening today. I, I just went to a meeting a couple of weeks ago and it had to deal with our school system um, and what the unified school districts are doing with this new curriculum that comes outside of the school district. If you don't know this, uh, all the curriculum is picked by the union, and the union is made up of politicians. Um, and they are indoctrinating our kids with the things they want them to learn. And so they're bringing in this new material that's teaching our children uh, how to have sex. They're not teaching them biology, they're teaching them how to have, uh, I'm going to say this, they're going to teach them how to have anal sex, they're going to teach them how to have homosexual relationships and how to have them safely. And they're telling them that they have rights that their rights are just as valuable as our civil rights. And they're putting their rights on the plane of civil rights, saying that if your parents then disagree with you, and, and whether you feel that you're a woman or a girl or a boy, then you can turn them in. So this is what our country's coming to. This is happening now. You might say, well, you're lying. That's fake news. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Search it out. I'm telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what these experts are saying, psychologists that are against this, uh, school districts that are agreeing, but their hands are tied. There were school district superintendents that were there, and they said, this is the law. We can't do anything. We're being honest with you. This is what we have to do. We got to follow the law. <clears throat> and then others who are trying to stop it. 
So they're blasphemers against, uh, blasphemers, obedient uh, to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Boy, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Oh boy. Uh, most of the world doesn't go to church on Sunday morning because it's their day off and they need to rest, which is a pleasure, by the way. But God created Sundays for the Sabbath day and he said that day is to be used to focus on God. Uh, and that's why we go to church, to focus on God, to worship him in song and praise and then to read through his word and get it explained to us and then applied the application of the word and then fellowship with the believers. Uh, our service starts at, uh, what, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning when people are here serving, preparing, setting up. And then it goes through to 9.30, and then we begin to do the worship, and then we do the word. And then at 11 o'clock, we then serve again. The, the people that are here, we serve food, and they fellowship. We also serve food to the community, to the homeless, to those who do not have as much uh, constantly. And then right around 2 o'clock, 1.30, 2 o'clock, we start <clears throat> closing things down. It's an all-day event, and it's an all-day event that we don't think of ourselves, we think of others besides ourselves, and most of all, we think of God, that we're here to worship God. But there are those that don't go to church at all because of the pleasures that they have. Sundays, I got you know, this baseball game to go to, this football game that my kids are in, this soccer game that they got to play, or I got the fair, you know, I work six days a week and Sunday is the only day that I need to go to the fair. And so I'm going to the fairgrounds, pleasures. I go to the mountains, I go to the rivers, I go this and that, you know, they have places to go. Then there's what you have is in Christians where it's a every other week situation. We worship God one week, we worship our pleasures the next week. And so it's every other week week that we go to church. Um, it's, you know, it's about pleasures of ourselves rather than thinking of others more highly. I think of those who serve here that it's 24 um, seven. They give food, clothing to the poor. And it's not just on Sunday morning, it's whenever they ask. And there are times where they go in the middle of the night. Sometimes they travel many miles to get food to them because it's not a one day thing. And it's not about their pleasure, it's about serving others. So I think you get my point there. And I know some of you are probably upset at me, uh, but this is the signs of the last day. And then five, most of all, having a form of godliness, but denying the power. And then he even says, from such people, turn away. Turn away from these people. Now, what does he mean by uh, form of godliness? These are the Christians that come in and say, praise God, hallelujah. Hey, brother, can I pray for you? But then they don't pray. You know, and, and they're saying hallelujah and praise Jesus. And then they go on Monday and they live their lives you know, like the rest of the world. They're drinking, they're partying. They're, they're living their world and cheating in business and doing all of these things, just like the world is. There, there's a, there is a, as he says here, a form, a form of godliness. It looks like it on the outside, but on the inside it's not. That's religion. That is, that's the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Those are those men that wore the long robes and the phylacteries on their head so they can tell you that I've got scriptures in my head and I'm meditating on every single day who stand on the corners and, and they throw dust on themselves and, and they pray and they fast and they let you know they're praying and they're fasting because it's a form of godliness. Jesus then said, what about the other guy that's on, that doesn't stand on the corner that just says, woe is me, Lord, a sinner, help me. See, that is humility when we realize I shouldn't be on a corner. I shouldn't be throwing dust. I don't care if people see me or not. It's about my relationship with Jesus Christ. So there's a form of godliness, but they deny the power. There's no power in their life. There's no strength in their life at all. He goes on, for of this, this sort are those who creep into households and make captive the gullible. That is the weak, the silly, and the needy. Uh, they make them gullible. Because of their gullibleness, they come in and they manipulate them. <clears throat> Women loaded down with sins, led away by various lust, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so there are those people that are gullible. 
<clears throat> they follow anything. Um, if it sounds bad to them, oh, I don't want to follow that. That's not something that I want to go after. Uh, so they're not seeking really truth. They're seeking whatever meets their needs, whatever tickles their ears, as the Bible says. Um, and men will come and give them that because they want something from them. Uh, we read on uh, Sunday, if you didn't watch the service, we read on Sunday how the Apostle Paul wouldn't even take a salary because he thought he might offend the Corinthians. And so he'd rather take nothing from them so that he would have the opportunity to preach the gospel. And that's one thing that, that we ministers should understand, that the gospel is not for sale. That it's not something that we should be selling. And these preachers that are on TV, and I'm going to call them out, these preachers that are on TV and that are asking for $1,000 or they're asking for money, don't give it to them <laughs> because they're keeping it for themselves. And it's obvious, it's so obvious with the jets, you know, and the mansions and, and so forth. You see all that. They should be living. And Pastor Chuck made it very clear in Calvary Chapel that they should be living <clears throat> along with their church and where they're at in their community. They shouldn't be above them. Uh, he made that very clear. I remember one time Pastor Chuck uh, chastise a couple of people <clears throat> at a pastor's conference. They had <clears throat> they had purchased some vehicles that Chuck felt was a little too pricey for a pastor. And he literally got up there and says, you know, just sitting there, you know, there's some of us here who like to drive around in Mercedes and a BMW. And I'm not saying it's sin, but I'm saying that it's an appearance of something wrong. <laughs> You know, and he's just, and everyone's just like, whoa, who's he talking about here? You know, and they knew who he was talking about, you know, and that was Chuck. Chuck never bought a brand new car. He always bought a one-year-old car, and it usually was the same model. I think it was a Lincoln Continental, and, and he never bought any more. And that's what he felt was, you know, reasonable in his place and status. So, so I think that you need to be careful of those that are in it for the, for the money, Always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. And then he gives us an example here of some men back then. Now, as uh, Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist uh, the truth. <clears throat> now, that's interesting because um, these two guys, we don't really know who they are. Their names named, uh, are not mentioned except only here, but obviously they were during the time of Moses and they were men that came against Moses. They could have been with Korah, who we know also came against Moses, and then God swallowed them up. <clears throat> um, I think we need to be careful. Holland Davis shared with the worship uh, uh, people at our conference recently, and he said, guys, you have to understand that you have to be careful that you respect your pastors. Um, these are God's anointed and you have to not touch them or come against them. You are there to lead the people, prepare their hearts so that his message that God has given to him would be able to permeate into their hearts and change them. Your job is not to watch over them. I had a guy one time tell me, God's called me to be your watchman. In other words, to watch you and correct you when you're wrong. And I thought, wow, what, what gift is that? I've got to find it because I don't find it anywhere. I know there's the, there's the Holy Spirit who does that, but I didn't know there was a man who did that. <clears throat> and so I'm leery of people who, who do that. Again, that's just another way of, of coming against or resisting uh, leadership. And I think that there's something to be said about the attitude that we have towards those that are our leaders. We need to be very, very careful. Um, he says here that they resisted Moses so do these, that is these that Paul is talking about, resisting the truth. They resist the truth also. Uh, and so you have to be very careful. <clears throat> he says, men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. Um, you know what happens, and I've seen it. <clears throat> I've been in ministry for 30, 33 years or so. It's 30, something like that, 33 years. 19 yeah, 33 years. And I've seen men come into this church that I've raised up as leaders or men that wanted to be leaders and they went about it the wrong way. Uh, they've come up against leadership. There are times when they felt they would lead. Uh, whatever I said, they said, nope, it's wrong. I'm gonna do it the way that I wanna do it. And they did. 
and eventually they left and they took people with them. But you know, in all those years, I've never seen uh, really more than one who, <clears throat> who God began to use in a great way. They all just continue to be pew sitters. They all really don't do much. Now I'm not saying God doesn't use them or forgive them. It's just that God uh, isn't going to use them to the, to the ability that he wanted to use them if they were submitted to the leadership and understood uh, the authority and how God has established it. <clears throat> and even the one that I know of who's become a, a pastor has done it in the wrong way. Because it's in their attitude, it's in, already in their DNA that, that they're going to do it their way and not the right way, not the biblical way. And so I've never seen that uh, take place. And so there's always a price to pay when you touch God's anointed. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifested to all as, also, as theirs also was. And then he continues concerning apostate. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecution, affection, uh, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, uh, what persecution I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. So Paul gives a personal testimony here of how God used him as an example of being faithful to the Lord. When he says, followed my doctrine, he's saying, followed Christ's doctrine, because that's his doctrine. His doctrine is the Bible. I believe the Bible is 100% accurate from Genesis to Revelation. I believe there's no errors in the Bible. I have studied the original language in the New Testament. I have seen uh, manuscripts and scrolls of the original language. And the only, the, there are no errors. The only discrepancies are that, discrepancies where possibly a, a letter, instead of it being a T, Maybe they left a little, just to give you an example, a little cross on the top off, but that's about it. Never changing the context and the meaning of the scriptures. These were scribal errors. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but in the Old Testament, when a scribe or a recorder would write down the scriptures, he had a role. And he would start in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he would just keep writing and keep rolling the script, the roll. Till he got done. If all of a sudden he was in Isaiah and he made a mistake, oh, he'd take the roll, burn it up, throw it away, and start over again. New roll in the beginning. God, that's how accurate they wanted to be with those scriptures. But a few got by for whatever reason um, and just the way that it is. So they were very accurate. And Paul says that's his doctrine. He believes in the word of God just as I do. Um, he was persecuted. And I, I guess what Paul is saying is, look at my life, guys. Look at my life. Look what I've been through. Look at how God has delivered me. Follow me as I follow Christ because for those reasons. In verse 12, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. So if you're a Christian and you want to live for Christ, you, you can't get around that. You're just going to suffer persecution. So accept that. Accept it. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's last day signs. But as for you, continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise in salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So now he's speaking to Timothy, saying, don't forget what you've learned. From a child, you've learned the scriptures. Your mother and your grandmother have taught you these scriptures. And then you've been taught by myself as I took you in as a pupil and as a disciple. Don't give up on those. Be faithful no matter what. You're going to suffer persecution. People will come against you. But you are to love them gently, kindly, mercifully, sharing the truth. Even though they'll spew in your face and accuse bullies just the way it is but you don't have to be a bully. And then he gives us one of the most profound verses in the Bible. He says, all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. How many scriptures? 
all scriptures. You know, there are some Christian scholars who said we can't believe the letters of Paul. We have to stick with Jesus' words only. Paul said all scriptures by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Some say you can't even believe the Gospels. You have to only believe in what Jesus said. Paul said all scriptures, all scriptures, very clear here through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And our scriptures are good and profitable for sound doctrine, sound teaching, instruction, correction, uh, in righteousness. So how important is it for us to read the Bible or at least be taught the Bible? Very important for us. This is our heritage. This is who we are. And if we call ourselves Christians, we should be Christians from the Bible. Amen? Amen. If you believe that, I want you to put amen on the post here on this video. Those of you that are watching, just put amen and let me know that you agree that it doesn't take long it's a m e n amen <laughs> not a whole lot of work i would appreciate that let's pray gracious father i thank you lord for your precious word lord we are living in the last days and i do pray father that you would open up the eyes of your believers to see and they would wake up from their sleep lord and begin to realize father that they shouldn't be seeking after pleasures father but seeking after god completely lord May you fill us with your spirit today as you lead us and guide us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you guys have any prayer requests, please um, post them and we'll pray for you. We're going to take some time and pray. If you don't want someone to see it, then private message me and I'll pray for you personally. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.